It's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker for today, Dr. Prakasam Tata. Over the past 40 years, Dr. Tata has held various positions at institutions both in the U.S. and abroad. He has served as an advisor to various governmental bodies, including the National Academy of Sciences, USAID, UNDP, and the World Bank. From 1974 until his retirement in 2002, Dr. Tata held positions in the Research and Development Department of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. In 2002, Dr. Tata retired as head of the Environmental Monitoring and Research Division. Dr. Tata currently serves as executive director for the Center for Waste Transformation Technology in Wheaton, Illinois. In his retirement, Dr. Tata has stayed actively involved in water and sanitation issues both in the U.S. and abroad. Through partnerships with Rotary International and the Indian government, he has completed two large-scale sanitation and water treatment facilities in the Vizianagaram district of Andhra Pradesh in India. For the past four years, he has also been involved in motivating primary, junior, and senior high school students, as well as college and university students, as well as communities in India, to create awareness of the importance of water conservation and safe sanitation and hygiene practices by celebrating the World Water Day in the last week of March. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tata. Thank you, Michael. How many of you are real teachers and how many of you came here to learn something? Real teachers, please, who teach every day, raise your hands. Uh, raise your hands now who are teachers as well as students for this kind of thing. Okay. Now you see, when I was a kid, I went to school in India. My mother taught me to love your teacher. First of all, of course, mother is the god, goddess, whatever you want to call it. And then the father, the third in the hierarchy is the guru. You must have heard the name, term guru. Guru, how many of you have heard this term, guru? So teacher is a guru. Guru is not just a simple teacher, but actually inculcates some moral values and how to conduct your life and so on and so forth. So I love the teachers. But one thing I hated about the teachers is giving quizzes. <laughs> you know, and I always thought when I get an opportunity to address the teacher, I'll give them a quiz. This is my chance now to give you a quiz. <laughs> All right? Now, I, had, I came here last two days diligently listening to everybody what they're going to say because I don't want to repeat too much. And uh, there are some slides. It's like regurgitation. Some things we learn, we don't want to forget it before we leave. So I'm going to show some slides and then we regurgitate some of it. And some of it probably you will learn from what I talk, but definitely you're going to see what a guy like me who's 75 years old can do things in life. That's one thing. Okay, let's, quiz. let's start the quiz now. How many miles of lakefront does Chicago have? Anybody knows? 24.7. Somebody said some other number. 26. Anybody else? Make a guess. 30. Lower. <laughs> it is 28.15 miles. All right. What city has the world's largest sewage treatment plant with secondary biological treatment process. Yes, sir. Huh? Chicago, yes. Correct, 100%. A plus. Do you know the name of the treatment plant? If you know it, don't say that. I don't want to give you two double A pluses. Yes, anybody else? Stickney, yes. That's the plant you're going to visit. And that is the plant where I worked for 30 years. Sewage may be something for you. It is my bread and butter all my life. Now a trick question. Is Shed Aquarium the largest indoor aquarium? Yes or no? Atlanta? Okay, that is news to me, but I thought it was a shed aquarium is the yes answer for that. Uh, maybe with the outside the aquarium coupled with uh, 
the dolphins and things like that, probably still the largest, I think. So you see, we had to learn something about Chicago before we leave. Of course, you learned something about the Chicago uh, canal system and so forth from the previous speaker and the invasive species and so forth. Now a little bit about my background to tell you with what passion I'm going to tell you something today. It is a life's journey. I was motivated when I was 19. I got just my master's degree. I didn't know what to do with my life. This tall American from St. Louis, he was working for the public service at that time. And he came on a mission to India as a professor to teach at the All India Institute of Asian Public Health. At that time, it was called the TCM, or the Technical Cooperation Mission, which is now the USAID. I didn't know what sewage is. I don't know what water supply is. And he was the one who motivated me in the interview, by the way. He didn't ask me any questions like Indian system. You know, you have to be, it will be worse than uh, Ms. Kagan's, uh, um, the, the, the Senate is interviewing her right now. It's worse questions than that. You know, Indians, they go with the students when you get a job, you know, they go with all kinds of uh, um, cockroaches crawling in your stomach because you know what kind of questions the interviewers are going to ask you. Uh, so I prepared like fully, you know, with all kinds of equations and questions and formulae. But this guy didn't ask me anything, but he mentioned about water. This is 1955 when I was 19 years old. And sanitation and how bad the sanitation and water supply system in India was. So he said, son, this is up to you people like you to change something in this country. So learn something about water, water supply, wastewater treatment and do your best to your country. And 25 years from now, that means 55 plus 25 is what, 1980, the whole world will be talking about water, water scarcity, and pollution of air and water environment. And uh, I don't know what this guy was talking to me about, you know, because I was prepared to give his answers, solving equations and things like that. He's telling me all this stuff. I readily said, yeah, okay, whatever he's telling me, it was inspiring. But still, I don't know whether I would get the job or not. Believe it or not, three weeks flat, I got a letter from him. He hired me as an assistant to work in the rural areas of Bengal. I come from northern Andhra Pradesh, which speaks a completely different language. How many of you are vegetarians? Raise your hand. I think all of you are vegetarians. Don't you eat vegetables every day? <laughs> okay. So I, I'm a vegetarian. This guy was telling these guys eat fish in Bengal, and you had to do this, that, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. To make a very long story short, he gave me the job and that changed my life. 1955, I entered this profession and I retired in 2002. That's a dream come true for me to work at the world's largest waste treatment plant uh, as doing some research and stuff like that. That happened to me. So how many people can claim that, you know, that you want to do something when you were 19? It happened to me. I'm very grateful uh, to this country and to India, which gave me birth, and to my mother and my father and everybody else. That is the brief introduction, and I think I'm a diligent servant uh, to the municipality here, as well as to the other people that have served. And right now, I'm giving my time to um, actually serve some of these on these projects, both in Naperville, Illinois, to my community in Naperville, as well as the place of birth, that is Vijayanagaram in northern Andhra Pradesh. That's what it is. Uh, as I go through uh, my uh, presentation now, I'm going to. Uh, talk about some resources which Michael kindly put on the line. Uh, you please go through that. And there also there is a sheet over there um, that, that was passed around with the schematic on the front page and the back page. There are some exercises that I have suggested to the teachers so that they can assign them uh, to their students. And you can feel free to ask me anything later on. I'm, I'm going to be here soon after the lunch also. With that, let me hit this projector here. My outline of presentation, uh, water and looming, uh, the looming water crisis. I mean, a lot of people already have talked about it, so I will quickly glance through this. And some water and sanitation facts. Again, several people uh, have mentioned about some of the facts, but I compiled a small booklet uh, called Water Facts, and it is put online. You can see that and read it at your pleasure, because a lot of statistics are given there uh, about production of goods and services and uh, some of the facts of the world, sanitation, water supply, so forth. I will talk a little bit about water quality issues, and I will talk about two case studies which are very dear to my heart, 
and that I made them happen in my own life with my own efforts, I can say that. We talked about this, the same water existed on Earth billions of years ago. Still exists today, the same water. The good Lord has given us a finite source. So, this, again, this world water, again, by the end of this workshop, you should be able to tell your students, everybody, that less than 2.5% of the water that is present on this globe is only fresh water. That's all what we have, of which, again, this is a division of the glaciers, and we just had a lot of it, about 68.7% in uh, ice, and that is being now melted because of the climate change, all these ramifications of the climate change, you also heard about it, and the permafrost, groundwater and surface water. Groundwater is the b biggest bulk of surface, that water that we have for drinking, or for um, domestic use and industrial use, what have you, and surface water is only 0.4% of the available fresh water. So again, these facts, I think if somebody wakes you up in the night, you should be able to tell to your students. That is message at least you should take from this conference, or this workshop. Most of this ice, this again, less than 1% of all fresh water is really accessible for human use. One of the things I don't like really personally in my life is to take these uh, plastic bottles of water carrying around, around, because yesterday they told us also that we don't know what the quality of the water is, it's maybe the simple plain tape water. So just consider it when you organize your conferences and things like that, don't place all these bottles of water right in the podium, uh, the plastic and containers in it. You never know what is leaching from the plastic also. And less than 0.007% of all the water on earth is available for us to drink. The population of the globe is increasing. Today we are about 6.1 billion people. So you can really see water being constant and the population being changing every day or every year. Uh, the available water per capita is diminishing. That's a very logical conclusion, I think. And temporal and spatial distribution of water is erratic. Some places it, uh, it uh, pours and some, some places it is drought. And so it's not uniform. And climate change impacts are not making things easier either because all things and all the rain comes in, the glaciers are melting, and we hear about these things. The floods on one side, droughts on the other side. Bangladesh, for example, like clockwork, you can predict floods. Every monsoon season, every monsoon season, tons of reports come in. How many people have died because of the floods of the low-lying areas near, near coastal regions? These are all the very poor people. The rich sits on the top all the time and they are not impacted. For them, it's a business as usual, I'm sorry to say. While you can go almost a month without food, your body can, sur can survive one week without water. A yogi like me, perhaps maybe 10 days. <laughs> so it is not unreasonable to say that a water crisis is looming. We all agreed on this one, right? Have we agreed on this? So we, we have a water crisis that's imminent. UN says 50 liters of water per capita per day are needed. You know what? Being a crazy researcher all my life and professor type, I said, let me experiment it on myself, how much of water I would go by with. In my good old days, I don't have a shower. Even in university when I was doing master's degree, I never showered because the shower was there. But it, and I turned it on, the water never came. So the attendant would bring a bucket of water and give you a tumbler. That is the extent of water that you have to shave, do anything you want, and shave, take your bath and everything, what not. So here in America, in one of the richest cyber, uh, neighborhoods in Naperville, Illinois, this Prakash Thada wanted to experiment on himself with how much water in Naperville I can go by where there is a faucet where I turn it on, it gives me water. The electricity gives me light. So I sat there, I told my wife, you know, don't think I'm crazy, but I'm going to experiment myself with how much water I can get by. And he, guess what? I, very nicely, the same body condition, and I go out, the same hygiene and everything I have, I could go by with 30 liters of water, in which I have to use the flush toilet, probably two or three times, hide it up for some time. But then, with 30 liters, I could go by. And it is 30 to 45% of the water that we use in the water just goes through the drain by just simple flushing. 
Every time you have children, they go to the bathroom and then flush it for nothing and then come back. And so this itself is a big guzzler, the Western devised toilet. Millions of people in the world live on less than three gallons per each day in Africa particularly. And this is about the global water crisis. Again, fortification, these, these figures speak very powerfully. 25% lack access to safe drinking water. 50% lack access to hygienic sanitation. Imagine how blessed we are in this country, particularly in Chicago, with this big lake front in front of us. Falling water tables, salt water intrusion is a big problem. The, you're just draining the water table. And, and there's depleted availability because of that. And contaminated drinking water. Here we have heard already pathogens, toxic chemicals and fertilizers, etc. all these other new compounds, emerging compounds into the market every day. So many thousands of chemicals are coming into the market. And we don't know what effect they do have in the long term. Doubling of urban population expected by 2025. So we will have pressure in urban water supplies. Recently I was in India from December 10th to March 28th. And I, I have witnessed actually these things are happening. There was, uh, there was a small stretch of um, road I walked by to go to a park to do my exercise in the morning. Then the, this municipality in Vishakhapatnam, which is a coastal town, has declared that they're going to cut down the water supply to 30 minutes every other day. They give their supply. And then I saw this water truck that came in to deliver the water and a lot of people that live on the same street, it is again, is an urban area. They came with their big plastic buckets and all that stuff, you know, to carry the water. There was a big line, and there were people who were fighting already. But these little, uh, maybe 15, 20 liters uh, containers, maybe two or three of them, like jerry cans and stuff like that. So it is happening in a place where we never saw any water shortages in this place. I'll talk to you about that a little bit, about the in condition in India, about how much water is being supplied in different places. So with the increasing population, particularly the migration of labor from the villages, it is happening now at a very rapid rate in India because of the economic growth that the paper, papers you know, tout that India is rising and so forth. There are two Indias, ladies and gentlemen. One is the rich India and the other is the very poor India. That, that's not changing. Then let it not be a mystery for you that 50% of the people are li uh, li living at less than $1.25 a day. So this is the fact of life. They are, their lives are not getting any better. World Water, Report, World Water Development Report said 507 conflictive events during the last 50 years. We, talk, we talked about transboundary waters yesterday and the conflicts between the countries, among countries, where the rivers flow through. 37 involved in violence, 20 of these consisted of military act. Yesterday, Shields talked about the situation in Bolivia, people's revolt. 18 of the above between Israel and its neighbors. And it's not going to get any better, believe it or not. And uh, this is one of the villages I'm working right now. The government is trying its best to give some water supply to them. They laid these pipes. And when I went there and saw this, one day, these water two pipes, you know, stand pipes, they have their heyday. And these pipes were stolen. Or maybe they, they were taken out for repair. And they never put back. And there's a little um, thing that you can see on the side, that water tap. And uh, that is not even working properly. This used to be the water supply of that village, which they provided, but there is no water like that there anymore. And this is an abandoned shallow dug well in the village I'm working right now. There, is a, there was a well. There was water there, the water table. People were drawing well, uh, water from this well. And now it is completely uh, using as a garbage can. And this is a typical scene in Indian towns. This is taken in one of the areas that I traveled, you know, uh, where they're waiting for the water tap to be opened by the municipality in that restricted number of hours, which again is not to say they're going to regularly open at 6.15 in the morning and shut it off at 8 o'clock. No, it is variable. So you have to wait there thinking that the water will come uh, pretty soon during that one hour, two hour, three hour window. So a lot of people waste their time sitting there and doing nothing so that the water, when the water comes in, they can collect it. Some of these transboundary waters, you know, we talked about yesterday. I don't want to delve on this. But India, there, I think there's a problem looming with its neighbors, particularly with China, um, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, this political situation being there. They shared the common rivers. And you never know when this will become a big conflict. Other indicators of water crisis. Half of world's wetlands are lost. 
more than one-fifth of the species were extinct. Freshwater species index fell by 50%. And slower decline in, uh, the, of the, this index in advanced countries is a little bit deceptive because all the damage was already done with the industrial, post-industrial revolution and a lot of, lot of the industry dumping their waste even prior to the Clean Water Act and its amendments of 19, 1972. Because we produced cheap goods like in, the, like in China. And we polluted rivers. Rivers caught fire like the Cuyahoga ri River in, uh, in um, Ohio. They caught fire. The fire you know, there is a fire actually that river burned because of the, all the petrochemical greases and everything like that floating on the top of the river. And somebody threw a match in it, the river was on fire. So it is not uncommon in the United States to have these water pollution disasters in the past. Even in our own uh, city, 1899, when there was a big incident, 12% of the city died because of cholera and, the, and, and other typhoid diseases. Chicago was a developing city, like a developing country in the, in the century. But we have learned from history that that's why you know, the, the, the river was reversed, just to protect the population. So this is the feat, that is engineering feat, that Chicago did it. The immediate solution to the problem is dilution of sewage and at the same time reversal of Chicago River so that, it, that, that lake is not get contaminated. There's a pressure water resource that's where we are drawing the water from. So that was the best engineering solution for a small cost in a very rapid way that the Chicago forefathers have thought about it that was saved at that time. So of course now we are seeing it in new problems. So yesterday somebody was telling, for each solution there is a new problem that comes in. So we are humans who have intelligence, we can solve the problems. I'm a born optimist. I think we can find solutions. Unfortunately though, unless the crisis hits, we don't manage our situation very well. And same thing with water. What who thinks cares about water in Chicago? When you go to the lake, my goodness, any of the international visitors come in, Doc, you don't have any problem here. You have a big lake, you can take any water that you want it. But they don't understand the ramifications of sharing waters from a common water source which is internationally bound by treaties. So these are the kinds of things we are managing, and I'm sure I'm a, being an optimist. I think, um, as our previous speaker said, you know, we can find solutions. But the only thing is, people don't listen to us, scientists and teachers and researchers. If you say, well, I had of your time something, the people think it is crazy. He is trying to threaten us. But when the situation happens, like the Gulf, then people are jumping, and we don't have a solution for that thing. And it's, you know, we are rapidly waiting for, for, a, uh, for a good solution in the Gulf region right now although it was 72 or 73 days now, since the oil sp spill started. Look at these water supply in cities. Bangalore, the Silicon Valley of India, 2006 and 2007 is 11 hours per day. Chennai, three hours. This is a progression. Early in the 1890s, they used to get 20, 20 24 hours per day, the water supply. And this is the town, the last one in Vishakhapatnam, where my sister lives. I go there and visit. That's my base of operations when I go there. It is 0.45 hours. And when I went there this time, this is again 2007, and I was telling my sister, you are going to face water shortages. Now 2010, December, that law was declared, you know, that half an hour every other day. And then some days the water was not even delivered. That is the situation there. So what can we do to tackle water scarcity? There are many persons, we talked about some of these things. Collection and storage, rainwater harvesting, rainwater barrels here, even in this great land of the United States where water is plentiful, see, look at the rain barrels. Preservation of quality of surface and groundwater is very important. We have to do that. You may have water, but if that water is contaminated, what are we going to do with it? I'll talk about this a little bit later, and how natural, natural forces also are contaminating the water supplies. This is not a man-made thing, but it is a natural thing. Use optimization. There are very, various uses of water, you know, for municipality, industrial, agriculture, and so forth. We already saw some figures of that. I'm not going to delve into that. But again, you can optimize its use. Conservation, this is a very important thing. Whatever water we have, if we can conserve it, today we are using 50 liters for something, and maybe if we can reduce it to 40 liters, you have a 10, about 20% reduction in your water use. That is conserved. Treatment of brackish and saline water, which was also talked upon, that 97.5% of salt water is there, but it's very expensive, but some countries are doing it. It's a, it's a shameful thing. I went to Dubai, you know, the, to, to see Dubai, you know, this is a desert country. I see there's many cure lawns and there's very nice, beautiful parks and things like that, how they're doing it, because it's all with distilled water, sea water. They're distilling it, and that water, you know, go there, blazing hot sun, 120 degrees, and the sprinklers are going on to make their lawns, keeping the lawns. How can anybody do that, knowing 
that other people in the other poor people in the world don't have a good glass of water to drink. I mean, don't you get a little bit ashamed to do this? Yes, if you are probably rich and mighty, you can do that, I guess. Some means to cope with water shortage, implement co water conservation measures, conduct awareness in public education campaigns. Here, I beg you, teacher, you are the source. You can change generations. The youngsters, their minds are not corrupted. You can steer them in the right direction. Here, create awareness for them, in them. Make them useful citizens, not let them produce a little more than what they, cons than they consume. If everybody produces a little bit more than what they consume, think about what's going to happen in the world. There'll be more for everybody. Practice rainwater harvesting, practice good housekeeping and water management practices, both in industry and agriculture. Industry has come a long way. They used to say once pen passed through, now they're implementing dust water management practices and recycling, reuse type of thing. Their water consumption in the steel industry has gone down significantly. Peter Gleick, uh, when he was making the first announcement on the radio, I was listening to him, and he said when they were using 2,000 tons of water for each ton of water, I mean each ton of steel they're producing, now with one third and one fourth the quantity, you can produce the same ton of steel. So there is a, if you have the resolve to conserve water, you can find ways to do it. As scientists and engineers and teachers, we can do it. Control transmission evaporation losses, we talked about this. Implement waterless sanitation. In the California, the city I saw that some of the public, a lot of the pub public buildings, they installed waterless sanitation devices, urinals and lavatories and things like that. So we can do that. Conduct awareness and public education campaigns, I told you again, I repeat this, because it is the one thing that we can do without too much of expense. The teachers particularly can do that and advocates and activists can do this very easily. You have to have a big mouth like me. And then use appropriate landscaping, arid climates. Isn't it foolish to grow some, take out the natural plantations in one of the big pastures and then cultivate them with uh, grass and Kentucky bluegrass and use the, all the pesticides and um, fertilizers and all that? Instead of that, why can't we, like the Tel Labs did it, you know, plant a lot of na native plants, they, they look beautiful to me. You don't have to water them, they die, they come back again. Potential of harvest, you know, you can ca easily calculate if you have roof surfaces, so many square meters and how much water that gets in there, so you can know how many cubic meters of water that's going to collect. It's a very simple calculation. And based on that, you're in January, and if you have the willpower to do it, certainly you can conserve a lot of water by putting a cistern in the backyard and so forth. Of course, the actual quantity of water depends on the transpiration, evaporation losses, and how you manage to collect it. And this is a simple um, rooftop, rainwater harvesting. The water gets collected, it gets filtered through gutters and things like that through a filter. And then you have a cistern, and you have a pump. Again, use it back. In the, in the, it's a self uh, type of a system that you can have, in, in particularly in apartment complexes and so forth. It may not be used for drinking, but certainly for flushing toilets, I think, at least. Again, these things are there in that book um, that I, a small booklet, you know, that, that we're going to put online. So look at this statis statistics here. Every dollar spent on water sand improvements in developing countries would benefit, would bring back a benefit of three to thirty-four dollars, depending on the region. Isn't it a very nice benefit to cost ratio? But we don't, because that comes to the later part. You can you have a lot of money to buy bombs and guns and for the defense purposes, but not to provide safe drinking water to the public. Where a lot of people, some more facts, waterborne disease causes 80% of illnesses in death in developing countries. I am actually exposed to the waterborne disease when I was 19 years old in this village where I went to, in Bengal. And, uh, you know, I got rid of it, of course, but how did it get to me, I don't know. Preaching about clean water, still I got it because uh, because they they use uh, primitive sanitation, and then probably I walked into that water which is contaminated with some parasitic eggs, and somehow it entered. Or I ate some cabbage, you know, coleslaw or something like that, which was irrigated with some kind of uh, polluted water. It found its way. So I mean, I'm sure most of uh, are you, most of you are aware when you go south of the border, they t they call you watch out for the Montezuma's revenge. So. This is one of those things that we are constantly exposed when you travel, maybe it's due to globalization, we go there and bring up some of these things here. So these things are very rampant, even in a developing country somewhere, and also depending on where you have these ethnic populations living and so forth. 
Um, more than 5 million people die every year. Half of the world's hospital beds are occupied by people suffering not from big diseases, suffering from waterborne diseases. One third of the world population endures some form of water scarcity. And here, this is a statistic from UNICEF, WHO. 2015, the projected people without sanitation uh, in rural areas, 1.698 billion uh, people and 692 million in urban areas. Two thirds of Africans don't have a toilet at home. 40% in the world lack of access of toilets. Lack of sanitary facilities is a barrier for education of girls. This, this bothers me very much. You know, in India, you go to a school. The girls go to school in the villages. When they attain an age of puberty, they stop going to school because there's no bathroom there, for God's sake. That boils the heck out of me. And then they stay at home, and then that is the end of their educational career. Imagine if you don't eat one steak dinner one night, maybe 10 nights, if you don't eat, you can build a nice latrine, maybe bathroom complex in every school. And these girls would have a chance to be better citizens of the world. Just think of that. 200 million people do not have access to safe drinking water. Again, the same statistics. You can read this, the sanitation textbooks. Rural areas. The government says 96.13% are fully covered in India. I went to villages to see where these 96.13% coverage was. Again, there is a fraud here. They, there are statistics. Some big officer puts the statistics. If you go there, they say they built 100 latrines. That are, I don't see the 100 latrines there. Some of them are converted into uh, sheds to store thatch or hay. And some of them converted into living quarters. You don't see the latrine because it's easy to go to the bush. It doesn't cost anything. The government gives the money to build these things. It's somewhat misappropriated. When once you say the statistics are built, it's built. So they, the district collector gives the room and then they, they publish the things and you and put the statistics out and you think it's all built. Please, take these statistics with a pinch of salt. Urban areas, paper water supply for a few hours in a day is the norm. This is, a, this is, this is, this is not a secret. Delivery by tanks and bottled water user in, is soaring like crazy, even in India. Again, some of these facts are given there. Annual cost of degradation in India is 1.7 to 2% of the gross domestic product. Think of it. 200 million workdays are lost at a cost of $9 billion. Bottled water consumption increasing like crazy. Then, of course, this is a quantity scarcity. We're talking about the, what, are the, what about the water quality issues? They're physical. You see the turbidity, odor, temperature. Chemical, inorganics. Arsenic fluoride is a big problem in certain belts of India. We'll talk about that. Organics. This morning, Mandy talked about these things. Pesticides, solvents, oil, etc. Biological pathogens. This is a bit of serious thing also. These are the water quality in different continents. The, they say percent of disinfected and contaminated water supplies. You can see this yellow represent the, uh, the percentage that is uh, disinfected and the other is contaminated water supply. Uh, even the water supplies that are supposed to be a good water supply is they are not disinfected. Diseases are caused by contaminated drinking water. Cholera, typhoid, cryptosporidium. In Milwaukee, when it happened, everybody woke up. Now it became a standard, more or less, we get to do this. Hookworm roundworms, these this are endemic diseases in most developing countries, particularly in South Asia and Southeast Asia. This is due to chemicals in drinking water. This is not a man made thing, this is a geological formation. Arsenic and fluoride. Toxic organics and heavy metals, of course, are man-induced. One thing I want to know on this one, the last but the one, you see, diarrheal diseases which can be easily prevented. 17% of infant mortalities caused by bad water. And some of the contamination pathways, you know, if you go to India, I'm sure you'll, you'll go to the hinterland, not at the Taj Mahal, places like that. If you go, any tanks that are there, they are multi-purpose tanks. They use it for everything, washing clothes, drinking water, you know, you name it, cooking, all kinds of things. This is one typical scene, a woman getting her water for some purpose, and then one hand is she has a, a cloth that she just washed. This is in the Kerala coast, I saw this. These are some of the conditions of the wells. These are the shallow wells, dug wells, from which the water is taken, actually, for drinking. I lived on this kind of a water. 
up to the age of 19. That is the, uh, we have a house, um, you know, shallow dug well in there. Of course, we maintain that very nicely and cleanly. But this is the bucket and rope. This is the means by which the contamination takes place. And uh, there are no testing labs even to test it, whether it's the, what the condition of that thing is. But that happens. That is the water that um, the people drink. Sometimes I feel, you know, maybe it's a good thing. You know the reason why? We built that little immunity. But look at me. I built that immunity drinking the polluted water. And then, you know, I know, I know, I, love, I go to India, I never fall sick. And uh, believe it or not, this is true. Only thing is, I, my, my sister keeps the water boiled for me in a bottle, and I carry it with me. And I only, if I had to drink water outside, I think, I, I, I just only take um, um, uh, uh, hot tea. This is another secret, I'm telling you. If you go to India or other countries, if you don't want to drink water, hot tea is the best. Bottled water, I don't believe. I don't trust it. Look at the pipes that are going through ditches and drains in which they're submerged. Is that an indication? They may be at a higher level, but when the monsoon comes in, this is a way uh, through by means uh, by which means you know these pipes are contaminated. Although it is at the point of uh, production, it has very good quality. By the time it reaches home, it is contaminated. And this is the village I'm working on. This is the condition of a tube well where this young lady is pumping water, and you can see this uh, sewage channel over there next to it. And God only knows what the quality of the water in that uh, uh, tube well, uh, from in which Prime is pumping into this, this, this aluminum pitcher that she has there. And this is the other thing in the northeastern India, in the Gangetic Belt, the United Nations dug bore wells, thinking that the water coming from there is going to be um, arsenic free. But this, this is all laid with an arsenic. Look at the arsenic poisoning, what it is, the hands. And again, estimated two wells, I don't have to tell you all the statistics, they are there. Um, so many wells are contaminated. There is an endemic population with arsenic poisoning, slow poisoning the Bangladeshis and in Calcutta in that areas. Fluorosis is another big thing. This is not anything man-made, but it's a geological formation. And uh, if you have excess fluoride in your water, it, it provides mortal teeth and bad bones, the brittle bones and things like that. But if it's lower, you have cavities in your teeth. Look at that. These are the ones with fluorosis. These are the teeth. They are not uh, eat chewing beetle leaves, but excess fluoride in the drinking water. And look at these guys, poor guys, the knee lock giant, and all these bones are uh, just uh, unbelievable. When you see these people in my own state in Andhra Pradesh, where I came from originally, there's one big district, it's called Nalagonda district. It's dismal. Sanitation is 21.9%. Again, one statistic I want to see that 26.23 is their coverage in households above poverty line, 18.13 below poverty line. They need sanitation facilities. And here is the village I'm working on. And that is the Kohler toilet, the state of the modern toilet, one or two toilets there in the village. These women were crying on my shoulder, do something for us. And we can do a lot of the things that you have already talked about, what kind of uh, systems we can use uh, to help this um, sanitation situation. Again, these are squatting plate latrines, and this is, uh, again, an eco-sanitation facility where you can shoot the urine and collect urine separately and separate the feces from that. These are all available. Technology is available. Technology is not the problem. And here is a double pit latrine. One latrine is being used. The other is being used, filled up, and then it's closed. And you can make compost out of it. Septic tanks. And this is, again, a waste resource recovery system, integrated water system, wherein you can make wealth from filth. You can do this. Um, I mean, you can see the slides in you know, how waste are collected, pretreatment, anaerobic digestion. You can make produce biogas from it, and the residue can be used as a fertilizer. And then the effluent coming from the, you can have aquaculture. This is a practice in uh, eastern southeastern Asian countries like Korea, uh, Bank, Thailand, and China. You can grow fish. You can grow algae, which can be used for animal feed, and the effluent can be irrigated to grow crops. And we are now trying to do a project in Indiana, Hammond completely zero discharge project, you know, that um, we're working with. If it's going to happen, we'll be uh, diverting 38 MGD of sewage, uh, not into the Grand Calumet River, but to actually pr producing some good things out of it. Can we individuals make a difference in tackling environmental pollution problems? I say it emphatically, yes. I think so. Be the chain that you want to see in the world. Uh, this is where I would, that's what Gandhi said. If you really believe in in teaching your kids, I want to raise for a minute. 
and let's make it this to this. Okay? Now, to conserve water, if you believe in this, in the whole issue of conserving water, please get up. Say, let's, and I'm doing this as activists every place I go. I think it's a good thing for you to do in your classrooms also. I pledge to save water. Say after me. I pledge to save water. I will never waste water. I will not contaminate our drinking water. I will not pollute our precious water resources. I pledge to conserve every drop of water that I can every day of the week. I pledge to celebrate World Water Day on March 22nd of every year with my students in my school to bring awareness to the students as well as their parents. Thank you. Have a seat. So I have a lot of stuff to cover, but I will take quickly cover two stories. I will, I'll be around here to address these things again. There are two case studies I have done. I want you to read a Google my name, Prakasam Tata, and then read an essay called Dreaming in Color. It is it may be archived someplace. If you put my name, Prakasam Tata, comma, Dreaming in Color, you will get an essay. That will give you a passionate story of mine, how I achieved one of the projects. This is the remediation of polluted lake in Vijayanagaram, India. Vijayanagaram is just north of the Vishakapatnam a little bit on the map. And uh, I, was ch I challenged the local administrator to remediate the pollution of this lake because it was 170, 120 year old uh, lake into which sewage is being discharged. It is a 170 acres of man-made uh, water body, 10 feet and 12 feet mid, mid depth. And it's being polluted by sewage by 40,000 to 50,000 people. And it stinks like crazy in summer. We have bad weather holidays. The college gets closed you know, for a few days where I went to college. Uh, because the smell, not so much of the uh, hot weather or rainy weather or something like that. So I presented a design to this guy, challenged him, and I asked him to build it. And uh, these are some details. It will be in the paper. And this is the situation. This drain empties into this, like a sewage channel, into this water body. This is another channel coming into this water body. Those are two other channels discharging into the lake. And uh, it, you can see the lake to the right. Um, it's a big water body, 170 acres. It looks like this. I don't know what the guy is doing over there. <laughs> and this is a schematic that you have in your folder. This is nothing but a two parallel trains of a waste stabilization fund system. We have a screen chamber to get rid of all the big bulky stuff. And then we have a splitter box into which the sewage is intercepted and collected and forced into this splitter box. Now the sewage is not getting into the lake directly at these three different uh, points where it is being discharged. And then we have a deep faculty pond. This is an anaerobic pond at the bottom, and top layers may be a little bit aerobic, but it's not. And there the solids settle down. They get cooked at the bottom and then get digested. It's a form of stabilization by anaerobic processes. And then it goes to a high-rate uh, high algal pond, the next pond, where photosynthesis does take place. And that oxygen produced in the photosynthesis stabilizes the colloidal and suspended organic matter that remains there. And then we have an algal settling pond because of the growth of the algae grow there and they settle in that pond. And then there is a maturation pond at the end where the solar disinfection takes place. And the water that comes out of it is 95 plus percent pollution removed. And then it is uh, very good for agri agricultural quality of water. That, and then it is back pumped into the uh, big tank over there. It is actually discharged by gravity. All this is by gravity. There's no power, no pumping, nothing because it is designed that way. And it looks like this now, no. that place. And that's what we decorated, uh, the roads that go around. And then we have some places, park benches to see where people never sat. They were sitting and watching the water body now. And then there is a lover's lane. Young kids, there is an ice cream stand. So I mean, it's such a beautiful thing for me to see when I was a kid, I was wondering why filaria, these elephant legs, my aunt had an elephant leg because this, the, the glands swell and then accumulate water. They can't walk properly. I was wondering, you know, and I was looking at, she used to be pretty like Marilyn Monroe with legs like that, but she had these big legs because of this Uchiraria bankruptia, a parasite carried by mosquito vector, and she was like that. 
And I asked my science teacher, and he motivated me, a teacher motivated me to understand what's going on here. And God willing, I will do something for this place. I'm so glad, I'm really blessed to do this project with my persistence. It took me 15 years and read the story and the dreaming in color. <laughs> and the estimated cost is half a million dollars. And I motivated the guy did this project for nothing, whereas an American consultant native-born American asked for $75,000 for the project proposal itself. But I gave the designs and developed the drawings, and he, of course, the district collector paid for the drawings for $5,000, and he bought me a ticket to go there. That's it. And I gave them everything for free. And uh, this is working now. Lately, I had a problem about managing this project. I was talking to uh, one of the teachers here. And this is the other project. I will take five more minutes, if you don't mind. Finish it off. This, I said, again, another my dream. When I was working in this village of Bengal, I thought there was no sanitation there. There is no uh, running water, no electricity, no telephone, no radio, nothing. I was thrown into this when I was 19 years old at the motivation of this great American Frederickson who motivated me to be in this field. Then I said, there is nothing here, what am I going to do? Then I'm very scared to get the water from the hands of these villagers when I went to their houses, their huts. I said, if I have a way to do it one day, I will, be, I will be able to do it, to produce a clean village with a small community where I'm not afraid to take a glass of water from their, from their pot or whatever it is. That was the dream I had at that time. And now I'm glad to say I realized that thing through Rotary International. I'm a Rotarian, a proud one, and my club in Naperville made this happen. These are some of the Rotary Club of Vijayanagar University Place where I was born, Bharati Tirtha, an NGO I'm running. And uh, this India Development Coalition of America, I'm the president of it. Today is my last day for that. So I am a rabble rouser. I call the people and they say, God damn it, you have to do something for your place. And then it happened. And then we have to install a 24 7 water supply and sanitation system that will provide drinking water that is not salty to taste, hygienic and sanitary latrines provide them, clean bathrooms and running water to households for washing, cleansing, wastewater treatment, complete recycle and reuse of treated wastewater, income generation for sustainability. Yesterday they meant when water, sanitation, sustainability is the main thing. You have to have the sustainable things. So, how do we sustain this project? So, I designed this project water supply, sanitation, the water supply is by reverse osmosis. And then we produce more water than the villagers need. And that water is sold in the market. They are willing to buy. I asked them to fix the price for them, two rupees, that is one twentieth of a dollar, for 12 liters of water given in uh, disinfected bottles. And this, why 12 liters? Because the child can carry. If it is a 25 liter jug, they, cannot be, they may not be able to carry. So all these things were thought of. It's a great design. I, we put the best minds to make it work. But again, it's a question of maintenance and operation, as some Mandy mentioned this morning in her, because she's experienced in the Mexican uh, condition there. And these are the two guys, my, my partners in crime, my club president, uh, Pat Merriweather, and Chuck Newman. Now he's an architect. So I took him there. Well, I want to give that facility to them like the one I want to use it, not this dinky little pit latrine or something like that. If I don't want to use it, why anybody should use it? So I took them there, and this is the village. Approach road, these are the people that are taking the water in their head. And again, is a septic tank, and then there's a drain field and disposal, and just the schematics. This is the under construction. And now this is the bathroom that looks like this. So latrines on one side, on the left hand side, right hand side of the bathrooms. There is a men's complex and there is a women's complex. There are two wash basins, like in my own house. It's like a Taj Mahal. Look at the atrium, that, that roof up there. Fantastic. I mean, you, you stand there, you feel like, uh, you know, doing more of a big job, you know, <laughs> not get out of it. And here is a bathroom with a tap, and that is a latrine, of course, it's an Indian style, and there is a flush water tank, and this is a women's complex, there is a lock and key for this, and look at the dome. It, it, it gives you, not the ambience of a dirty latrine, but something very aesthetic and beautiful. And this is a men's complex. And between the two, we wanted to have a park, like environment. So this is what we created, and that is the whole uh, system there. And now, this is the RO system in that house there that produces 10,000, it is a capacity of 1,000 liters per day, uh, per, per hour. So if the power is there, you can produce 24,000 liters per day. But we want to run it only for eight, eight to 10 hours. So they, these are the villagers I'm serving. I mean. These are like my mothers and sisters, and look at these beautiful people. 
but they don't have anything in the form of a latrine. The bush is their privacy. Night is the privacy for these women. Can you imagine that? What a shame. But now these people have a place to go with all their pride. So what we as teachers and water sand professionals can do to help, develop and have a passion to inspire the poor about the need to conserve water. Whenever you get a chance, go out and preach it. Like a Paris priest or whatever. Educate the rich not to squander with the resources. Agriculture and industry not to squander it. Work with your communities to create awareness of the looming water crisis. The technology is very simple. It is a piece of cake. It is available for you. You ask me, I will give it for free to you. Inspire students from early childhood to conserve water and practice safe hygiene practices. Volunteer and give it. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Yes, or so, are there any questions in the audience? Uh, we have one up here. Uh, what was the cost of the second system? The second oh, forty-three thousand dollars. Forty-three. Forty-three. Yes. And the final accounts are not in yet, so I will let you know. But I think it should be less than forty-three thousand because we could not provide more latrines because of the footprint, but I couldn't get the land. Yes. Thank you for speaking. It was fascinating. Um, one of your slides reflected hours of running water in three villages, what well, one city, Bangalore, and then Chennai, and then um, a village, Andhra Pradesh. And it indicated that the amount of hours of water availability in ba Bangalore has increased to 11 hours? No, no. It was, it used to be 20 to 24 hours. It got depleted. Oh, so in all three it was uh, depleted? All the, all the places is going down, but something interesting is happening. In Chennai, for example, there was a, 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 a very good administrator from the government side, and she mandated rainwater harvesting. And the groundwater table remarkably increased. Now each and every house has to have a rain, you know, rain harvesting structure. And uh, the groundwater table is increasing there. So, um, and same thing in Bangalore. They are thinking of also implementing this thing. I don't know whether a law has been passed there to do this. But the trend is towards rainwater harvesting and also clean up some of the tanks, you know, which are filled with mud and detritus over the period of time. Yesterday a question came about Maharaja uh, maintaining these systems. You know, it's unfortunate. With the dawn of independence in India, um, the purses of Maharajas were taken away. What the Maharajas used to do every summer season, they used to dig up, uh, degrade the tanks, and put that as a manure in the open fields, this like an organic farming. But as, the, as, the, as we, India got the independence, the Maharajas didn't have the responsibility to maintain those things anymore. The government did not do a good job in maintaining these tanks. As a consequence, a lot of great stormwater runoff, you know, sediment and all these things got filled up. Particularly the low lying, uh, low shallow depth tanks, when they were filled up, these greedy real estate people and then political leaders occupied those lands immorally, illegally, and built apartment complexes and so forth. So the, the concrete pavement increased. So there is no recharging of the groundwater table. As a consequence, all the water that was falling in the three months, months of monsoon is now running away, evaporating, you know, go to the oceans rather than going into the ground. So there are a lot of mismanagement of these water bodies, you know. That's the reason why the water is being depleted, the, uh, the water in the reservoirs is getting depleted. Um, all of it comes at one time, and we don't have a storage capacity. We don't even think about that. The, the, when the monsoon comes in for the next few months, water is there plentiful, and then people forget about everything, and then again comes summer. This is a cyclical process, like the, uh, the diseases in, in Bangladesh. But water management comes a little later and all the priorities of the government. But one day, th when their pants on fire, you'll see what's going to happen. 